Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, July 7th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape. Steps and steps and steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is one of our famous vacation shows. The first real vacation during the pandemic. Isn't that wonderful? So exciting. I will be basically doing nothing. Um... I'll be making grilled cheese sandwiches and entertaining my children and probably day drinking. I'm not going to lie. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I at this point? However, for you today, we do have something special. Professor Michael Pettis. Trade wars are class wars. How rising inequality distorts the global economy and threatens international peace. This is uh, fascinating stuff. What we, and, and I should say, for this week, um, you know, we, we didn't really theme it per se, uh, although it it's there. There's you know a lot of it's relevant, obviously, to the day. But um, Michael Pettis, we have on this week Michael Pettis and Stephanie Kelton, and Pettis, a lot of his work is not necessarily based on uh MMT but it is there's like it's there's MMT comes into play a little bit in terms of the way you conceptualize deficits and surpluses and um this is interesting stuff I, I'll be honest with you going into this interview I was a little worried that I wouldn't be able to do it because it's complicated, but uh, Pettis really lays it out very clearly. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I said it on air with him uh, when we recorded it, but I, I made it clear. I said, uh, Professor, um, I have some, some news for you. You're going to be teaching a survey class today. <laughs> this is, we're going to do, we're going to do your class 101. Uh, but it's very interesting stuff. And later in the week, we will be talking to Stephanie Kelton who many of you probably are aware of. We've interviewed her three times over the years, since 2012. I think I mentioned that in the interview with her. I was shocked. Um, She is one of the um, foremost advocates of modern monetary theory. And uh, her perspective on a lot of things is is, is slowly being adopted. I mean, one, you know, we saw... uh, for a long time, we were told that if we had a certain percentage amount of debt relative to GDP, we were going to, uh, the economy was going to sink and we were Weimar Germany, et cetera, et cetera. None of that happened. And so uh, people are coming around to this. And particularly right now, it's hugely important uh, because we're going to have to do a tremendous amount of spending, the government is, uh, to get us out of this in, in one piece. And, um, and, and we will see um, if, if her message uh, permeates. But um, this, uh, this work by Michael Pettis is very interesting, and um, these are, these are going to be really relevant topics um, when we get to the other side of this, assuming we do. I mean, if the aliens, when they invade, allow us to maintain some sense of normalcy, who knows? They, they could also have some ability to turn back time or go future into time, where we could all turn into floating orbs. And many of the issues that we have today would be, obviously, I don't think I need to tell you this, uh, but largely irrelevant if we were just floating orbs. Now, I don't know exactly 
what uh, what kind of you know the intricacies of being a floating orb. I'm just saying. As you can see, folks, I'm recording this before we go on vacation, and I needed it bad. So, uh, quick break. Uh, members will have, uh, I believe, some uh, deep archive stuff. Maybe not today. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, maybe it'll be uh, the next day, or maybe it is today, or maybe it was yesterday. I don't know. But uh, throughout the week, we're going to try and add some of that uh, for our members. You can become one of those people uh, by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. It is uh, a great way to support this program at a time where uh, your support is uh, is very much needed. Uh, as always, if you can't, um, uh, if you want access to the fun half and you don't have the funds, send us an email, majorityreporters at gmail.com. I will get to it uh, probably now over vacation uh, in between my day drinking and um, grilled cheese sandwich making. Also, uh, don't forget, AM Quickie, we're doing that every, every morning. If you want the news and you want it live and you want it like a daily news brief, AM Quickie, amquickie.com, sign up totally free. Seven, eight minutes, you'll get all the top stories. You will be caught up. So check it out. Lucy is doing it all this week. She's great. So uh, check that out, amquickie.com. And uh, also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. We got merch in the merch store, shop.majorityreportradio.com. And uh, don't forget, shows like uh, The Michael Brooks Show, for instance. Patreon.com slash TMBS. YouTube.com slash TMBS. Michael's doing a show. I think tonight he's doing one live. So check that out. Uh, also, uh, The Antifada. Patreon.com slash The Antifada. And The No McKee Show. Patreon.com slash The No McKee Show. Also, YouTube.com. The No McKee Show. And uh, Literary Hangover on Twitch TV. So check out all those shows. But uh, you sign up for the AM Quickie. You'll get the uh, news rundown that you're looking for. Quick break. When we come back, Michael Pettis. Trade wars are class wars. How rising inequality distorts the global economy and threatens international peace. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program... Professor Michael Pettis. He is professor of finance at uh, Peking University's School of Management and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And of course, the uh, author, along with Matthew Klein, of Trade Wars Are Class Wars How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. Uh, Michael, um, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Sam. So um, first off, I should just say, this is going to be a little bit more of a 101 class uh, from your perspective, I think, than you're used to, just in terms of like some of the, uh, the, the basics as we go through this. Please uh, I- indulge me as I ask for probably a little bit more remedial uh, help than you're, you're, you're probably used to. But... Um, the the story, or essentially the 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 story that you and uh, Matthew Klein tell, is that our trade wars are rather a uh, instead of being a function of the various agendas of different countries, is in in many respects a function of the inequality within sectors across different countries. And how that plays out uh, across the board is that is that more or less right? And if so, or if not, can you correct me a little bit? No, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. 150 years ago, 200 years ago, trade imbalances really reflected production cost differentials. So, if England could make uh, textiles more cheaply than France. England would benefit by selling textiles to France. It would run a trade surplus. It would fund that trade surplus on the capital account, and it would uh, it would accumulate gold or silver or, or, or whatever. But it doesn't really work that way anymore. Um, trade uh, trade surpluses and trade deficits reflect income imbalances within the various countries. And the and the the thing that Matt and I try to point out is that if you look at the way these trade imbalances work, whether it's uh, Germany versus Spain before the crisis or China uh, or Japan versus the US, 
it's the same groups within both Germany and Spain or both uh, uh, the US and China that are losing out from this process, basically workers and middle-class savers and, and smaller producers. And it's the same groups in both countries that are benefiting it, uh, from it, uh, uh, owners of movable capital, the financial sector, and very, very large businesses. So the point that we try to make is rather than look at, say, the Chinese-US conflict as China versus the US, we need to understand the process. Both um, China and the US are suffering from rising income inequality. And it's the same process that's driving it in both countries. And uh, essentially, if I understand it, 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 it basically happens where uh, you have a situation where uh, the, the workers in the middle class, these households can't afford to consume what they produce. And so um, there is this, um, well, I guess uh, excess, um, it, it, it then becomes incumbent upon some other country to consume uh, that, and um, it, it, it's tied into the savings rate. So let, let, why don't we start with the savings rate? Give us, uh, will, you, will you explain to us what, that, what those terms mean and the uh, various implications it has and, and the differing savings rates that we see within a country and between countries. Okay. Um, the, the, the whole concept of savings rate is complex, not because the concept is complex, but because we use the word savings to mean so many different things. But from an economics point of view, your savings deposits may be your savings, but they are not the economic savings of the country. The savings of the country is very simply everything that's produced in the country, all the goods and services produced in that country that are not consumed. And if they're not consumed, by definition, they're saved. So when we talk about different savings rates, there's a lot of confusion here. A lot of people will tell you that uh, Germany and China have high savings rates and uh, the U.S. and Spain have low savings rates, and the reason is embedded in the culture. Germans, as we all know, are very thrifty and hardworking, and the same thing goes for the Chinese. Americans and Spanish don't work as hard, and they tend to be very spendthrift. Well, that's all nonsense, I and mean, it's literally nonsense. Germans uh, uh, work fewer hours per year than the average. The average German worker works less than the average Spanish worker, and Americans are notorious for the amount of work that they do. Um, and it's got nothing to do with, you know, the Spanish like to go to the beach and have siestas, and that's why uh, they don't save money. It has nothing to do with any of that. What it has to do with is purely the distribution of income. So uh, you can divide any country a, a number of ways, and let's take a, a simple way. Let's say that there are four sectors that explain all of an economy. There are ordinary people, there are rich people, there are businesses, and there are governments. That covers the entire country. Now, um, who consumes among those groups? Well, ordinary people consume most of their income. Uh, the rich consume a very low share of their income. Businesses consume none of their income. And then finally, governments consume a small share uh, uh, on behalf of households. So when governments pay for your schooling or your medical treatment or, or, or whatever, they're paying for your consumption. But those four groups have very, very different levels of consumption and savings. Um, so if you want the savings rate to go up, which is what Germany did with the labor reforms in 2003, it's very simple. Take money away from the high consuming groups, which is ordinary households, and give it to one of the other groups. Give it to the rich or give it to businesses or, as in the case of China, give it to the local governments. Automatically, the country's savings rate goes up. It has nothing to do with the culture of the people. It has to do with the distribution of income. So the point that Matt and I make, and, and this gets a little bit technical, but um, when a country saves more than it invests, then by definition, it's producing more goods and services 
than it is able to absorb domestically in the form of consumption or investment. So it must export the excess savings. Remember, it saves more than it invests. And simultaneously, it must run a trade surplus. So it must export the excess production. So what we point out is, uh, for example, uh, before 2003, German savings was less than German investments. Germany ran a trade deficit. And then they implemented a series of labor reforms, which is really a euphemism for forcing down wages. And immediately you saw wage growth in Germany almost stopped. Um, and business profits soared. So basically, by putting downward pressure on wages, you transferred money from ordinary Germans to German businesses. And automatically, the German savings rate soared. And that very high level of savings wasn't invested domestically. In fact, the, domestic, the investment share of GDP actually declined. And so they had to export all of those excess savings, and they exported it to Spain. I say Spain to represent Italy, Greece, you know, all of peripheral Europe. Right. Um, so that's the process. It's really that distribution in income that determines whether you're going to run a surplus or a deficit. Okay, so if if I if, if I could just walk through this because some of this um, I'm I I feel like I have a grasp of, and, and there's a couple of things that I'm. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure of. So when we talk about investment, if 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 we were to if Germany in that instance, they have um, they have uh, essentially instituted reforms that lower uh, wages and therefore those those workers are still producing what they normally produce. It's just that the the uh, the value of what they're producing is now uh, falls on the ledger of of the business side. And that's only a function if they can offload this excess, uh, this, this excess production, essentially. Right. I mean, it, it's is it is it conceivable that um, I mean, just to sort of make this really uh, a basic so that I can wrap my arms around it, the. Um, the, the, the German worker continues to produce as many uh, widgets or, or I should say maybe, some you know, uh, as widgets. Uh, they're doing so for less wages. However, there's just not a market for the widgets. And so they're just sitting in warehouses and the business, uh, the 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 uh, business owners, the the, the the capitalists, I guess, in this instance, uh, are just not able to get that share of value. Uh, and so the widgets need to be sent essentially uh, abroad? Is that, is that the, the dynamic here? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Um, Germany was producing 100 widgets, and the workers uh, consumed 70 of them, and the other 30 were invested in producing more widgets. And then you cut back on the uh, income of the workers, and now they could only produce now they can only consume 60 of the widgets, they, of the 100 that they've produced. So 60 goes to consumption, 30 goes to uh, uh, investment, and you've got 10 left over. So what do you do with them? If Germany were a closed economy, you would just pile them up in warehouses until finally the businesses said, enough is enough. We're going to have to close down production facilities and fire our workers. And this way you bring everything back into balance by firing your workers. It's not a good balance, but it's a balance. Uh, the alternative is to sell those 10 extra widgets to foreigners. And that's what Germany did. Okay. And, and, and the, the other option is to, uh, you said, is to I invest domestically. How would, what would that look like in that scenario? Well, um, most mainstream economists and certainly every supply side economist will tell you, well, this is simple. If the savings rate goes up, those savings can be used for investment purposes. So investment goes up. So in my German case, uh, workers uh, end up consuming only 60 of the widgets instead of 70. But it's not a problem. Instead of investing 30 widgets, invest 40 and the country will grow more quickly. That's true in theory, but what it requires is that Germany has a huge amount of desired investment, uh, which Germans can't do because they don't have enough savings. 
this was true 100, 200 years ago, and it's true today of developing countries. But in advanced economies, there is no savings constraint. Uh, um, there's huge amounts of capital available at the lowest interest rates in history. Uh, before COVID-19, American and European business were sitting on huge piles of cash, and they didn't know what to do with it. They were doing stock buybacks and acquisitions, right. which isn't real economic investment. So that's the key. If you're a developing country, this is not a problem. You increase your investment. But advanced nations can't do that. They already have as much investment as they want. There, there, in other words, there's, there's, no, there's no real slack there that uh that that investment can can actually add to uh to exactly. to con- and 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 in in many respects it seems to me that part of the problem that we had in the aughts at least in this country was a function of all that excess cash sloshing around looking for a place to um to invest and they started to create all of these sort of uh, financial innovations as a way of doing so, and uh, then look what we got. <laughs> it, it, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, okay, so to continue on that example, uh, Germany lowers wages, it increases its savings rate, it, 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 it's no longer able to consume everything it produces, so it exports it to Spain. What happens in Spain? Well, Germany exports 100 euros of excess savings to Spain, and now Spain has to do something with that money. Uh, And there's only two things that can happen in Spain. Either Spanish investment must go up or Spanish savings must go down. Uh, And that's because it's got to remain in balance. If Spain imports 100 euros of savings from Germany, not because it wanted to, but because the Germans dumped the money in Spain, then Spain has to rebalance its own uh, uh, relationship between investment and demand. Now, if Spain were a developing country, the story would be quite straightforward. Developing countries urgently need capital. And so Spanish businesses would grab that German capital and build some more bridges or, or, or whatever. Um, but as an advanced economy, Spain really didn't have that capital constraint, but it still has to balance. So if investment doesn't go up, then savings must go down. This is the thing that I, I, I won't say that Matt and I introduced it because 110 years ago, John Hobson was explaining this perfectly well. I I guess maybe Matt and I are reminding people, uh, and that is that there are many ways, as shocking as this seems, there are many ways that foreign money can force down the domestic savings rate. It could, for example, as you mentioned, flow into the Spanish stock market and real estate market and create a bubble, in which case the Spanish will feel richer, even though they're not, they'll feel richer and they'll go out and borrow money and increase their consumption which means when you borrow money, that's negative savings. So the savings rate goes down. Um, And there are other things that can happen. Basically, either household debt goes up, uh, government debt goes up, which didn't happen in the case of Spain, or unemployment goes up. All of those things automatically reduce the savings rate to bring things back into balance. And what we saw in Spain was before 2009, debt soared. Uh, You know, I grew up there. My family lives there. Debt was everywhere. Your dog could get a credit card. And then after 2009, when debt could no longer soar, unemployment soared. And remember, those were the alternatives. If investment didn't go up, then either debt had to go up or unemployment had to go up. And that's why we say that these things are so tightly linked, because Germany implemented reforms that basically screwed German workers. As a result, excess German savings poured into Spain, forcing the Spanish to choose between either more debt or more unemployment. At first, they chose debt, and then when they couldn't, they had to choose unemployment. So notice, it's the same group in both countries that got, that got screwed by the system. And that's the point we're trying to make. Let me just um, uh, uh, just uh, walk through one, one part of that, too, to make sure I, I understand that. So um, we, we have our widget scenario uh, coming out of Germany. They've got these extra 10 uh, widgets. 
they're going to essentially uh, offload them uh, in Spain uh, in the form of maybe it's it's cash. Maybe people go in, they buy. Um, they, 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 it's, it's, it could be an infusion into a a stock market, but it's, it's more likely like they're buying real estate or they're buying, um, they're, they, they go into Spain, that German money goes into Spain in one form or another and creates more, um, more widgets essentially that need to be absorbed by the country. Is that it in one fashion or another? And that's what creates debt. People have the opportunity to buy more or I mean, I've just can you give me a more like sort of concrete example of of the of the money that comes into Spain and the way that they have to react react to it? Okay, so um, Spain used to produce its own widgets and consume its own widgets. Everything was fine in Spain. But now the uh, the Germans are uh, exporting 100 euros of uh, uh, excess savings to Spain. And each widget costs 10 euros to make our our example easy. So Germany is producing 10 euros more, I'm sorry, 10 widgets more than they can consume. And they're saving 100 euros more than they can invest. So they export both to Spain. Uh, Now these 10 widgets, a move to Spain, and the Spanish are given the money from Germany with which to buy the widgets, not given, they're lent the money. Right. Um, so how do the Spanish buy these 10 more widgets? Well, there's two ways. One way is they can increase their consumption of widgets, even though their wealth hasn't gone up, their production of widgets hasn't gone up, but they can buy more widgets by borrowing money and buying widgets, or they have to stop producing widgets, 10 widgets. And they do that because the German widgets are cheaper than the Spanish uh, widgets. Um, And so a a Spanish company that makes widgets goes bankrupt and fires its workers. Those are the options it has. Buy more widgets or produce fewer widgets. And this is very much like what happened. I mean, this is really uh, obviously what happened with Spain, but with Greece in particular, uh, the the loans were there by this. uh, And and uh, and then all of a sudden the the musical chairs stops, I guess. It's exactly what happened. And and I I wrote a paper comparing this to what happened to Germany after the Franco-Prussian War when uh, 5 billion francs of reparations poured into Germany, exactly the same thing happened. Historically, when you pour an enormous amount of money into a country, this always happens. You get a stock market bubble, a real estate bubble, an explosion in debt. And then when the music stops, an explosion in unemployment. It's a pretty old story, and it always happens. But what's interesting is that every time that happens, we're told that the, uh, the, the, the country exporting the money, they're you know, hardworking and prudent, and the country that was receiving the money, they, you know, they go out and party and, and, and go crazy, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not what happened. What happened is the system has to adjust, and it has only a limited number of ways in which it can adjust, basically debt or unemployment. So what is, so as you tell this story that, um, that uh, essentially – uh, says that the, you know, the the dynamic here is less uh, uh, one between countries and more one really between classes. Um, what, what what is how, how would a um, a the, what would the conventional wisdom would it would it simply just be that uh, the 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 Germans are um, are, are more hardworking and uh, the Spanish just were having a you know a party. And that was was it. I mean, what when we talk about the trade war, let's say, between the United States and China, what's the dynamic that's happening there? How is it explained by the conventional wisdom? And, and what does your um, uh, your explanation, how, how does it differentiate? Well, the conventional wisdom is that China and the U.S. need each other because China overproduces and the U.S. overconsumes. And people will point out look, the U.S. has a very low savings rate, so it needs Chinese money. And luckily for us, the Chinese have a very high savings rate. But what we point out uh, is that, no, the U.S. has no control over its savings rate. If $100 from a foreigner, any foreigner, enters the U.S., and by the way, 
the U.S. is very special because of its very deep liquid financial markets and its very good corporate governance. All of the excess savings in the world tend to go to the U.S. Roughly half of all the excess savings goes to the U.S. and much of the rest goes to other countries, the so-called Anglo-Saxon economies that have similar financial markets. So the UK, Australia, Canada, et cetera. Now, if $100 of foreign money goes to the US, this is, uh, this is an accounting identity, either investment must go up by $100 or savings must go down. Now in the 19th century, when the US was a developing country, British money coming into the U.S. caused investment to go up. That's a good thing. But today, where we don't have that savings constraint, any American business that wants to invest can easily access the capital. If, an, if $100 now comes into the country, it's not going to cause any increase in investment. So it must reduce the savings rate, either through debt or through unemployment. So what I would argue is that as long as countries like the U.S. or, or England have these completely open, uh, well-governed, deep financial markets, then other countries that try to become competitive by lowering wages are able to do so by pouring the excess savings into the U.S. and forcing down the U.S. savings rate so that everything balances. The problem is that they balance with higher production and the U.S. balances with higher consumption. And that means a rapidly rising debt. That's the problem for the U.S. And so how would and, and, and the benefit, but there are beneficiaries of 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 this within the U.S., but it's a very limited sector that's benefiting from it. Yeah, basically Wall Street and uh, and the owners of movable capital, the, the controllers of the very, very large corporations who can take advantage of this process. Now, I was reading uh, uh, yesterday, I was reading Bill Clinton's speech when he signed NAFTA in 1993, and he made a very telling comment, which we hear over and over again. He said, look, NAFTA is going to create all kinds of problems and changes, but there's nothing we can do about it. Capital can fly around the world at the blink of an eye. That was the phrase he used. And as long as that can happen, there's nothing we can do about it. He's partly right, because in a completely open global economy where capital and trade can move around the world very quickly and very cheaply, then the way you become more competitive is by lowering your wages, either directly like Germany did or indirectly like China did, you can you know, depreciate your currency, you can wipe out your social safety net. Those are all ways of lowering wages. And the thing is, if I do it, then I become more competitive than you. And you have no choice. You have to do it too. So in this world, we're in this competitive, it's really a type of beggar thy neighbor policy, where I lower my wages, which reduces total demand in the world, but I get a bigger share of what's left. And then you do the same thing, and then I do the same thing, and then the result is income inequality has to rise, and either growth stops or debt rises. And you can see we've, we go back and forth between periods of, of negative growth and periods of soaring debt, but we have no period of decent uh, growth without soaring debt, and, and that's because it's impossible. Until we fix the system, it's impossible. And so um, is there it, it the 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 story is, is that this there is a um, I mean, I get is it is it is it chicken and egg when it comes to this wealth inequality and um, and the, you know, uh, this di this trade dynamic or is it uh, simply that the trade dynamic is is creating this wealth inequality, and then once you get that ball rolling, it continues to, um, uh, I guess, to, to reinforce itself. Well, that's the thing. It's a self-reinforcing process. And by the way, this is not new. Look at the 1920s, soaring income inequality and soaring debt until 1930, 33, when it was replaced by soaring unemployment. Look at the 1860s, uh, again, until 1873, exactly the same process. In the 1890s and 19, the early 1900s, same thing. Now, that was interrupted by World War I, 
But otherwise, it was exactly the same process. You're seeing soaring wealth inequality and, uh, and, and huge imbalances and, and, and soaring debt. These things all come together, and they're mutually reinforcing. But what, what, what was that wealth inequality at those uh, periods a function of, of, of tr- our dynamic with, with Great Britain, let's say? I mean, was it, was it a function of, of trade, or was that a, 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 a distinct phenomena that, that followed the same pattern? Well, there are many reasons for it, but trade made it easier to do because um, when businesses told their workers in America and Germany and Spain and China, wherever, that, look, we would love to pay you more money, but we can't. They're right. They can't. They can't because if you raise wages, you become less competitive internationally. And as long as somebody else is lowering wages, you're forced into that same dynamic. And we've had, we've had other things, too, uh, the weakening of trade unions, the uh, extremely high real interest rates in the 1980s. All of these other things contributed to the income inequality. But the point that, that we want to make is that in a hyper-globalized world without frictional trading costs and with no frictional cost of capital moving around the world, then that, that system becomes self-reinforcing and you can't get out of it. So the French often talk about, you know, we've got to raise wages and they never do it. And, and, and they can't because assume that you put into place something that raises uh, um, uh, uh, wages automatically in France. What will happen? Well, French businesses will go out of business. They'll, everybody in France will be buying foreign goods, which will be much, much cheaper. So basically raising wages will cause a surge in unemployment. So the point that we try to make is that this is the way this particular system works. Until we fix the system, we're not going to see an end in this increase in income inequality. And when you think about it, income inequality in the U.S. has been, in the world, has been rising since the late 1970s. That's 50 years, right? Or 40 to 50 years. We haven't, we've never seen such a long period of rising income inequality. And I would argue that there is a reason for it. And, and, you know, this is what it's it's the trade imbalances that allow all of this to happen, that reinforce it more than allow it. So, OK, so <clears throat> what what could we do uh, to to break that cycle? And is it different? Is the answer different for the United States um, as opposed to the rest of the world? Or is this a this is this a a problem that can only be. Um, uh, is the solution only one that could be international? Uh, the U.S. could uh, unilaterally break the system. And as the key player, as the key enabler of this process, it could do so. Uh, the problem is uh, we would have to give up uh, the role of the U.S. dollar as the dominant global uh, currency, which I think would be a good thing because I think it imposes an enormous cost on the U.S., But let me explain what we're trying to do about it, what the Trump administration is trying to do about it, and why that doesn't work. Uh, The Trump administration is trying to interrupt this process by implementing tariffs on goods. Now, 150 years ago, when England was uh, running a trade surplus with France because it could produce textiles more cheaply, uh, France could have put tariffs, and that would have stopped everything. Uh, the the, uh, the French would start buying French textiles. They would no longer buy cheap English textiles. Okay, that worked. But today that doesn't work because as long as China exports $100 of its excess savings to the United States, then China must run a surplus, and the United States must run a $100 deficit. Now, it doesn't have to be with each other. It could be with somebody else. But globally, China has to run $100 surplus and and the U.S. $100 deficit because that money coming into the U.S. forced down the U.S. savings rate. So if if you implement tariffs on Chinese goods, what should happen in theory? Well, what should happen is that the American deficit with China should go down the Chinese surplus with the United States should go down because of these tariffs, but the American deficit with the rest of the world should go up and the Chinese surplus with the rest of the world should go up. Well, that's exactly what's happened. The total American deficit 
has not come down, even though the American deficit with China has come down. The problem is the capital side, not the trade side. The trade side is just reflecting the capital imbalances. So, you know, we talk a lot about reshoring, and I want to explain why reshoring doesn't make any sense. If an American company closes down its factory and moves it to China because it's cheaper, in principle, that isn't a problem. It's a problem for the workers in that factory, but it's not a problem for the U.S., because what will happen is that the factory will move to China because they can make things uh, uh, more efficiently in China. It will pay its Chinese workers lots of money. Those Chinese workers will then have to go out and spend the money. And when they spend the money, they will have to import. And ultimately, they will import from the U.S. So the U.S. loses some manufacturers and other manufacturers grow even more, those that are more productive, more profitable. So both countries win. The reason this doesn't work is not because of the, the act of reshoring. The reason is that when that company goes to China and opens a factory in China, it doesn't pay a lot of money to the Chinese workers. It pays a very low share because in China, wages are the lowest share of GDP, household income, is roughly 50% of GDP. So this is the lowest in history. So that's the problem. It's not moving the factory to China that's the problem. It's moving the factory and then paying them such a low share that they can't consume, uh, they can't increase their consumption in line with the increase in production. What ends up happening is that the dollars don't come back to America in the form of Chinese importing American goods. They come back to America in the form of Chinese buying American assets, uh, American treasury bonds, et cetera. Is, um, so this is this may be complicated, but what I'm trying to say is that it's the capital side we have to focus on, not the trade side. I see. And 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 so uh, in that scenario where the American company goes to China, is there a um, I guess the, the the wage that they need to pay is one that is big enough to make up for the um, the to, to consume essentially what they're producing. But if that was the case, there'd be no value in that company going to China in the first place. Yeah, they would only go to China if there was a genuine gain, gain in efficiency. Um, just going to China because you don't have to pay anything, that would no longer work once Chinese workers are paid more or less in line it's not that they have to be paid as much as American workers. It's that they have to be paid relative to what they produce. Right. So in other words, if an American produces a hundred dollars of stuff and you pay him 80, then if a Chinese only produces $20 worth of stuff, you have to pay him 16. And then they're in line with each other. Wages and productivity are in line with each other. But if you pay the Chinese uh, 12, then it makes sense to move businesses out of the U.S. and into China. So the answer there is uh, is is capital constraints in some fashion. In other words, we can't we. we so w what does that mean for us? I mean, we, we can see that that doesn't um, the, the, the sort of the conventional approach to it doesn't work. What would it mean to constrain capital in that instance? Well, for example, the U.S. had capital constraints right up until around 1983. So we're often told that this is, you know, an, an, an heretical idea. It's insane. It's crazy. No one would ever do that. It's nonsense. We did that most of our history. Most countries have done it for most of their histories. Um, but what it would mean, for example, the simplest way would be to put a tax on capital inflows. Now, mainstream economists will say, no, that's crazy because the free flow of capital is part of the process that grows the global economy because capital is always moving from less efficient uses to more efficient uses, more productive uses. Now, I spent most of my career as a trader on, on Wall Street, and I can tell you that's nonsense. Most capital flow is uh, investment fads, it's uh, liquidity shifts, it's a uh, reserve accumulation, it's flight capital. Very little of the money flowing around the world is, is Warren Buffett looking for, you know, a good long-term investment in a productive facility. Most of it is speculative. So if you, if, you, if you impose controls on capital flows, 
particularly short-term controls so that in and out money gets penalized very heavily, but long-term money doesn't get penalized, then that makes it very difficult for countries with excess savings to dump it in the U.S. market. That means they have to resolve it domestically. And how do you resolve it domestically? Either build more useful infrastructure or pay your workers more. Those are the only options you have. So I would argue that this is the way to reverse this income inequality process by forcing people to resolve their domestic demand deficiencies at home rather than dumping them on on countries like the U.S. and the U.K. And so um, when that um, excess uh, savings, it, the, there's an attempt to, um, uh, to you know, essentially uh, to dump it in the United States. When they are constrained from doing so, uh, that money will have to return home and it'll either build more factories or raise uh, or, or, or go into other infrastructure, uh, you know, broadly speaking, other investments domestically or, or just simply investments in labor in terms of their value. What happens in the United States when that happens? So w- when we don't have that money coming in either into the, the stock markets or I guess theoretically like real estate markets, too, depending on, uh, you know, it, it, what what. What happens in the United States? How does that help the states in that instance? It can, the U.S. will adjust in, in many different ways. In part, the dollar will weaken a bit. Uh, in part, uh, the uh, uh, real estate and stock market bubbles will disappear. And, you know, by the way, real estate, rising real estate is, a, is an inequality process. When real estate prices go up, there's a transfer of wealth. Uh, from those who are short real estate, young people, poor people, to those who are long, which tend to be the rich. So if real estate prices come down dramatically, that's just a big transfer of wealth from the rich to the poor. Um, So processes like that, those kind of things would happen. And, And remember how that works. If you transfer wealth from somebody who doesn't consume to somebody who consumes, uh, automatically the consumption, uh, the consumption rate will go up uh, without the need to increase debt. That's the key point. So America will continue growing. It'll probably grow faster. But more importantly, it'll grow without downward pressure on wages and without soaring debt. It will be a much healthier type of growth. Um, the other thing that really the U.S. should do is invest in infrastructure, because God knows the U.S. has terrible infrastructure uh, and, uh, and the government should invest it. That's a good way of absorbing all of this excess savings. So um, if I was to uh, 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 appoint you uh, president of the United States, um, which I have no doubt would be a massive upgrade for all of us. I'm, I'm sure we all say that. Um, and you it were to- possibly be a downgrade. You, you're given exactly. It's true, and you're given you're given a you know a 30 day window. Um, we're going to suspend Congress, and uh, you're going to be able to impose um, these capital constraints. I mean, one is uh, you would finally it would finally be infrastructure week, and uh, we would invest uh, significantly into infrastructure. What would be the capital constraints? Like, what do they look like in sort of um, nuts and bolts policy uh, form? Well, we don't really have capital constraints, and this is where we talk about something called the uh, MMT, Modern Monetary Theory. Um, there's a lot of confusion about that and a lot of nonsense. People say MMT tells us that there is no debt constraint. That's not true. But what is true is that if you expand the money supply, the risk is always an increase in inflation. But inflation occurs when demand goes up faster than supply. So if the government just creates money or borrows money, $100, and uses it to improve the productivity of the country by $110, then the debt burden doesn't go up and you don't get inflation. What happens is that both demand and supply go up. So uh, let's say roads in New York City, the New York City roads are full of holes to the point where uh, New Yorkers spend a fortune constantly repairing their cars. Now imagine if you, the government just creates out of thin air $100 and uses it to repair the roads. 
Well, that increases the value of New Yorkers' cars by more than $100. So there's no inflationary impact. What ends up happening is that New Yorkers produce more, um, more good stuff, instead of producing cars in order to replace their broken down cars, they don't have to replace the broken down cars anymore. So the money expands in line with an expansion in the production of goods and services. So as long as the US has needed infrastructure spending, there really isn't a savings constraint. It can just borrow the money or create the money and invest it. Now, the, the, this isn't riskless because we all know that once governments spend enormous amounts of money, it becomes an addictive and it's very hard to get them to stop. And that's a real concern. But right now, I would argue with unemployment so high and with American infrastructure in such terrible shape, I don't think we need to worry right now about massive amounts of wasted money. I think the much bigger worry is massive amounts of economic contraction because of poor infrastructure and lots of unemployed workers. Uh, and, and but on the on the side of 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 saying to in terms of foreign inve- you know foreign uh, money coming into the to the states, how would you how would you you simply tax that as it is um, if you're buying a you know one of these uh, you know uh, I don't know a twenty million dollar apartment in one of these pencil buildings in in New York City or uh, you're coming in, and I, I don't know uh, what kind of form uh, foreign money uh, comes into the United States, uh, but or, and I guess maybe the stock market, and whatnot. It would just simply be taxed as it, it it essentially crosses the border. Yeah, we could tax specific transactions, but I get nervous about that. Uh, last year, a a Democratic senator, uh, uh, Tammy Baldwin, and a Republican, Josh Hawley, jointly submitted a bill in which they just said the Fed should tax all inflows. They just keep raising the tax until the inflows and outflows are balanced. Uh, And that seems to me a pretty good proposal because that really penalizes short-term money. But if you're going to build, if you're going to put 20, if you're going to put money in the U.S. for 20 years to build a factory, that tax will be so negligible, it, 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 it becomes a rounding error. If you're going to buy a, you know, a, a six-week U.S. government bond, that's going to be a very expensive tax. So it's the kind of discrimination that we would like to see. It discriminates short-term money and favors long-term money. But yeah, basically a tax on inflows. There are other things you can do too, more complicated, but that seems to me the simplest. Well, it is a, um, it, it's fascinating, and I feel like I've learned uh, a tremendous amount Um I, I I can't thank you en- enough, um, Michael Pettis. Oh my pleasure. The book is "Trade Wars Are Class Wars: How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace." Uh, we will put a link to that at Majority FM. Michael Pettis, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. It might take a street black guy to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Choice was made for the option where you don't get paid.